first item of business is portfolio questions. Uh, quite a lot to get through, so if it could be quick questions and succinct answers, that would be appreciated. And first of all, Finance and the Constitution. Question one, Jeremy Balfour. Oh, uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the Scottish Fiscal Commission's revenue forecast for the increase in the total rate of tax. Derek Mackay. The Scottish Fiscal Commission is responsible for producing income tax revenue forecasts. These forecasts set the amount of money that the Scottish Government can draw down from HM Treasury for each tax year. Scottish Government officials regularly engage with SFC during fiscal events as part of the SFC's regular challenge and Q&A process. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? The increase in forecast is to raise just three million annually, meaning that just a slight larger than expected behavioural effect could result in it being a measure that actually loses tax revenue. Given that the Cabinet Secretary has always professed to be practical when it comes to tax, if at the end of a financial year it was found that the increase in the top rate of tax had actually lost money, would he reverse the decision? Derek Mackay. It's a very interesting question, uh, which is why you asked it, of course. Um, of course I would uh, review the actual um, take from our tax decisions and make future tax decisions in light of that evidence. But the point at which we have set the top rate of tax is based on that expert advice from the SFC and also the Council of Economic Advisers. That was the optimal point at which to raise more money. But of course all such matters remain a uh, subject to review as we look forward to the next budget and tax uh, consideration. Supplementary from Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. The Government have cited the complex interaction between Scottish income tax policy and entitlement to universal credit in reducing the net benefit of the starter rate of income tax to just uh, £7. Can the Cabinet Secretary say whether he has requested uh, a resolution with the UK Government for a form of a disregard of the net benefit of the starter rate of income tax for the calculation of universal credit or a supplementary payment of universal credit so those will low-income earners don't miss out. Derek Mackay. Again, that's a valid question and one that I'm well aware of. I've been trying to work with uh, uh, the UK government to ensure that people enjoy the full benefit of the tax position, be more progressive in Scotland. I'm continuing to pursue a uh, UK government uh, to address this, of course, because it is in the UK government's gift to address this in terms of universal credit, and hopefully I'll get a positive result. But I continue to pursue UK government on this matter. Uh, because they haven't responded to date, it's certainly not a reason not to have a more progressive tax system, but of course I want people to enjoy all the benefit of it uh, in terms of those at the lower end paying uh, less tax than otherwise would. Question number two, Liam Kerr. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many appeals there were in relation to the 2017 business rates revaluation and how many have been resolved? Derek Mackay. As a 31st of December 2017, 73,577 properties have appealed the 2017 revaluation and 520 have been resolved. This represents 32% of all properties appealing the 2017 revaluation, which is similar to the 31% that had appealed at the same point in time at the 2010 revaluation. All appeals must be disposed of by local committees by 31st of December 2020, and there is a fast-track process for businesses who wish to have their hearing expedited. Liam Kerr. Th thank you, Cabinet Secretary, but it does also represent a 0.7% clear-up rate, and this is too slow. Uh, it's shocking that businesses are having to wait so long for their appeals to be resolved, which is causing businesses, especially small businesses across Scotland in my area, uh, a lot of concern. So with the new financial year fast approaching, what action is the Cabinet Secretary taking now to speed up the resolution process and what reassurances can he give to businesses that all will be resolved before it's too late? Derek McCann. I think I'm fairly familiar that Liam Kerr has a legal background and I'm sure that understands that the assessors and the appeals process is independent of government and I cannot direct um, assessors and appeals to carry out their function in a particular way. So I'm sure with that clarity, uh, their independence will be protected. But I have made uh, the point uh, without direction 
that of course we want them to be considered as quickly as possible. As a practical matter, uh, it is the case that appeals sometimes group appeals so they can consider them in batches, it's appropriate to do that. But of course I would want them to be considered as quickly as possible and in terms of wider engagement and support with assessors uh, and uh, appeals bodies, I'm trying to be as supportive as I can for them to execute their uh, functions effectively. Supplementary, James Kelly. Uh, thank you. In Glasgow alone, there were 10,480 uh, appeals lodged, none of which had been resolved by the 31st of December uh, 2017. Uh, this is totally unacceptable. Therefore, uh, will the Cabinet Secretary use his off offices to influence the assessors to ensure that a, a plan is published with timelines to resolve outstanding appeals or is he just going to blunder along while businesses suffer higher business rate costs and uncertainty? Derek Mackay. Just outrageous language. I tried to say I'm sympathetic for businesses that want to have their appeals heard, whilst at the same time pointing out that it's an independent process with a judicial element uh, there if required as well. How uh, assessors uh, conduct uh, these uh, appeals is largely a matter for them in keeping with legislation uh, and that guidance. So, of course, I'll, I'll provide encouragement as best I can, but without interference, because if I was interfering, I'm sure the opposition would be the first to criticise me for so doing. But in terms of the Barclay Review and quicker um, uh, revaluations, quicker implementation, more frequent revaluations and improvement of the assessors, I've certainly led a lot of work on that. And no wonder many representative organisations said that Scotland is actually ahead of the curve on rates reform, not always organisations that are easy for government to quote. So we actually have made a lot of progress here, but there is due process and that should be followed and the law should be respected. Question number three, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with other administrations in the UK in relation to government procurement post-Brexit. Derek McKay. We are reviewing Scottish legislation in this area to ensure it functions after the UK exits the EU. Members are well aware of our position, of course, eh, on that. Procurement is one of 24 areas identified by the UK Government as potentially requiring a new legislative framework in its analysis published on the 9th of March. As mandated by the JMC, EN, officials from the four UK administrations have met to explore the possible need for any such framework. Procurement is a devolved matter, and the Scottish Parliament has used its powers to establish a distinctive and, in many cases, more progressive and sustainable devolved procurement regime. And I'm clear that Brexit must not be used as cover to introduce any new constraint on our ability con to continue to do so. Gail Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. My own constituency of Caithness, Sutherland and Ross could potentially be adversely affected by the uncertainty caused by Brexit, particularly in the supply chain for large contracts. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that new arrangements need to be made and soon to ensure that all procurement can be effectively carried out with minimal disruption to the supply chain and to ensure continuity of service? Derek McKay. Uh, I know you wanted uh, brief uh, answers, presiding officer. Yes, in essence, I agree with that position and proposition. Yes, that was a good answer. <laughs> Supplementary to Murdo Fraser. We'll see if this one goes quite so smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what you mean, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, does, does the Finance Secretary agree with me that we should be seizing the opportunity that Brexit gives us to devise a new procurement policy free of EU constraints? that allows us to better use our extensive public spend to support uh, homegrown responsible businesses and thus grow our economy. Derek Mackay. Presiding officer, I am now conscious the quicker the answers, the more brief the answers I give you, the more members of the opposition you call. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 what I would say quite pragmatically is the Scottish Government will try and get the best in the circumstances and it clearly, for us, that means trying to get the best in terms of our so, uh, social and environmental and economic benefits from procurement and the safeguarding that we've put in place, going as far as we possibly can within the law. We want to safeguard that, uh, whether that's part of the negotiations with the UK government or anyone else for that matter. So we'll try and get the best that protects the, the kind of issues that we're debating uh, just 
last week uh, whilst complying with the law as well. Uh, but Murdo Fraser is well aware of the Scottish Government's position in relation to Brexit and UK-wide frameworks. Question number 14, Lockhart. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an updated estimate of how much it will cost to implement and administer the new tax bans introduced in the budget. Derek Mackay. We anticipate costs of up to £2 million in relation to the introduction of the rates and bans set for the tax year 1819, administration costs of £400,000 per year. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Um, so the introduction of the new tax bans will cost up to £2 million, or in the parliamentary response that uh, the Finance Secretary gave me to a written uh, question, he estimated, or HMRC estimated, that the cost may go up to £5 million, depending on the divergence of Scottish income tax rates with the rest of the UK. We've heard earlier that, according to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, the increase in the top rate will only bring in just three Could you get to your question, please, Mr. Lockhart? to the Scottish economy. So, will, does Mr. Mackay think the tax increase at the top rate was uh, justifiable uh, fiscally? And does he agree with the, fiscal, the Fraser Valander report issued earlier today that it is now time for a new economic policy in Scotland? Derek Mackay. Well, that was a bit of a mess of a question, <laughs> Presiding Officer. But in essence, I've answered this question accurately every time I've been asked it by the opposition. And if you keep asking why the number changes, it's because the HMRC give me a different a number in terms of the costs that they are projecting. It's true to say that their cost upper levels come down from £5 million to, as it stands at the moment, the figures that I've just given in answer uh, to that question. Now, maybe those uh, figures will come down further. That's a matter for HMRC to determine those costs in a working partnership uh, with them. So these are the figures that we have been given. As to the question, uh, is that divergence worth it? You bet it is, because it's turned a real terms reduction from the UK government's resource budget by the tax decisions we've taken into real terms growth for our public services. And that amounts to more than two or five million pounds. In total, in terms of the divergence, amounts to hundreds of millions of pounds more going into our public services, which I do believe has been welcomed by the people of Scotland. Supplementary, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Given that the new tax rates and bans incur a cost to implement and administer, would the Cabinet Secretary recognise that this cost could be better justified if, instead of tinkering round the edges, the Scottish Government used their new taxation powers so that the richest pay their fair share in order to properly tackle poverty, and specifically the shocking rise in child poverty in our rich country? Derek Mackay. The tax policy that we have delivered, in terms of just, say, the top rate of tax, delivers the optimum amount for the next financial year. The proposition that the Labour Party and some others were putting forward would have resulted in less money in the next financial year for our public services and to tackle some of the issues that Elaine Smith would like us to tackle. So I think we've made the right decisions and balanced decisions around taxation. And I don't think it's true to describe it as tinkering around the edges when what in effect it has realised is hundreds of millions of pounds more for our public services turning the real terms reduction to our budget from the Tories, thanks to the decisions that this parliament, this government uh, has taken uh, into real terms growth for our public services, lifting the public sector pay cap and delivering real terms growth for many parts of the public sector, including local government. Question number five, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will consider introducing a levy on vacant and derelict land. Derek Mackay. Vacant and derelict property is already liable for non-domestic rates subject to statutory exemptions and reliefs. Additionally, the Scottish Land Commission is looking at the development of a strategic approach to tackling vacant and derelict land and developing detailed proposals for a compulsory sales mechanism. Mark Preskill. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply? Um, data collected by the Scottish Vacant Derelict Land Survey shows that in Mid Scotland and Fife, over 900 hectares of land are vacant or derelict, an area greater than the entire town of Alloa. If this derelict land was made liable for non domestic rates, then it could be worth more than £7 million to councils in the region. In 2016, the Scottish Government promised to consult on introducing Come to such your question, a levy. Please. I understand the work of the SLC, but can the Minister confirm when this consultation will take place and when the, the SLC might report on its work so that councils can actually start to collect this money which they so desperately need to maintain vital public services? Derek Mackay. The Roundtable um, Forum has already been uh, 
convened, and I think I've supplied the minute to the Green Party before. I'm happy to do so again. In terms of the other work, I'm happy to look at timescales and report that back uh, to Mark Ruskell, but we should make decisions around this in an evidence-based fashion, and that's what I propose to do. Question number six, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Government, when considering awarding contracts, what importance its procurement process attaches to whether a company has signed the business pledge? Derek Mackay. We expect those who deliver public contracts to adopt ethical business and fair work practices, and the Scottish Government highlights the values of signing up to the voluntary Scottish business pledge as part of our procurement processes. And earlier this month, ministers wrote to the Scottish Government suppliers highlighting the benefits of and encouraging them to sign up to the business pledge. The Minister for Employability and Training announced in Parliament last week a review of the business pledge, uh, which will be focused on attracting greater business buy-in and impact. Kezia Dugdale. So this is a scheme which requires private sector firms to pay the living wage, avoid using exploitative zero-hour contracts and make progress on diversity and gender balance. So it is astonishing that after two years of the business pledge being in place, the finance sector is only now asking the companies it gives public money to to sign up to the pledge. Can I ask them why is there no target for companies to sign up to the business pledge from the Scottish Government, as confirmed to me by Keith Brown in a recent parliamentary question, and why is it not mandatory when he's giving away hundreds of millions of pounds of public money without banning these very, very important practices? Derek Mackay. It's not mandatory because it's not legal to make it mandatory as part of a contract. We're trying to encourage and promote and support, and incidentally, not just, not just encourage those who supply goods and products to the Scottish Government, but all parts of the business community. I was visiting a company today that doesn't rely on Scottish Government finance, but encouraging them to sign up to the business pledge as well, and I'm sure that they will uh, do that. Uh, and we should be encouraging as parliamentarians as many as possible. And you know, in terms of a target, of course we should be trying to ensure that every business in the country is delivering the business pledge. Why shouldn't we be trying to reach out and get as many as possible to deliver that? But we must do it. We must do it in Mr. a legal way. Dale, will you stop shouting from your seat, please? Carry on, please, Cabinet Secretary. We must absolutely do it in a legally compliant way. And in that regard, that's why the earlier question uh, was so important, because it shows our ability to even encourage may well be under threat as a consequence of some of the negotiations. So we've gone as far as we can and we'll continue to promote it. And in terms of the review of the business pledge and any other ideas around what we can do, we're happy to take that on board because we really believe that in the benefits that the business pledge can bring to businesses and wider society. Question number seven, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the Treasury's draft audit and accountability framework and its proposals for effective scrutiny of shared services. Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government is working very closely with HM Treasury to improve the current draft of the audit and accountability framework. Our aim is to ensure proper accountability to the Scottish Parliament of all devolved service delivery, whether that take place in the UK public body or Scottish public body, and effective assurance provided through independent national auditors. We also want to see a framework written as simply and as clearly as possible. Willie Coffey. <coughs> I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Both the Audit and Finance Committees as well as Audit Scotland have expressed concern about the proposed framework. It introduces unnecessary complexity and red tape and makes far worse a process that is already working reasonably well at the moment, where we already have good arrangements in place with HMRC and OBR staff regularly attending to give evidence. Can the Cabinet Secretary give the Chamber a commitment that the Scottish Government will try to persuade the UK Government to simplify this framework and make it far simpler and more workable. Derek Mackay. Indeed, the Scottish Government is trying to do that. We'll continue to do that and I'll report back to the member if I have any progress. Fairly quickly, please, I can take question eight. Graeme Day. The Scottish Government, how it ensures that any additional funding it provides to councils for specific purposes is used in that way. Derek Mackay. Funding that the Scottish Government allocates to local authorities for a specific purpose is provided by means of a ring fence specific grant. Each specific grant is accompanied by individual terms and conditions and is administered by the relevant policy team. This ensures that the money provided is used exactly for the purpose it was intended for. Graeme Day. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but can I draw his attention to the actions of Angus Council, which is to receive an additional £1.56 million 
for the purposes of meeting additional expenditure associated with social care, and which has passed on just £510,000 of that, made up of £200,000 for Carers Act implementation and £310,000 for living wage inflationary impact. And can I ask him whether he shares my anger that money earmarked for such important purposes is being pocketed by a local authority? Derek Mackay. Well, let me be clear here. Although the extra £66 million in support of social care in 1819 is not ring-fenced, I made it clear in my letter of the 14th of December to the President of COSLA and to all 32 local authority leaders, including Angus Council, that I would look to local authorities to continue to prioritise their financial support for social care. I did not receive any replies to say that councils were not prepared to accept the terms of the 1819 local government finance settlement, so I would expect all councils to fully comply with the terms set out in my letter. That concludes questions on the finance and constitution. I'll move on to economy, jobs and fair work. And question number one is Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what future infrastructure investment plans it has for South of Scotland. Keith Brown. The Scottish Government's infrastructure investment priorities include increasing the supply of affordable housing by 50,000 homes by 2021, continuing with expansion of broadband to deliver access to superfast broadband to all residential and business premises by 2021, the expansion of early learning and childcare, uh, which will benefit citizens across the country, including the south of Scotland. NHS Dumfries and Galleries Royal Infirmary, worth £275.5 million, has been completed recently. And within Scotland, schools for the future programmes in Joseph's College and North West Campus, Maxwell Town in Dumfries and Galloway and Jedburgh High School in the Scottish Borders are all currently in construction. Additionally, we are providing Forest Enterprise Scotland with £500,000 of capital funding in 2018-19, which will be used to develop infrastructure, improving the visitor offer in the south of Scotland. And finally, the Scottish Government has agreed heads of terms for the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region deal, investing £300 million over 15 years, and has also committed to exploring the potential for a borderlands inclusive growth deal. Emma Harper. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, answer. That's uh, really interesting news to hear, as well as the housing, schools and health investment that the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned. Um, I'm interested to know if there's part of the upgrades to road and rail infrastructure that are urgently needed in the southwest of Scotland as well, especially the 75, 76 and 77. Keith Brown. Uh, well, the Scottish Government understands the important role that this transport network plays in supporting the South West uh, in particular and the wider Scottish economies and has a good track record of investment in the South of Scotland. I could mention, of course, the uh, completion of the longest piece of new rail track in the whole of the UK for 100 years, which was the Borders Railway uh, elsewhere in the South of Scotland. However, we know that further improvements are important to local businesses and communities. I know the member has made uh, many representations on this issue, and that's why we've recently commissioned the South West Scotland Transport Study. That study will consider the rationale for further improvements on the key strategic road and rail corridors across the region with a focus on access to the ports at Cairn Ryan and will also consider uh, the case for change in relation to transport infrastructure investment which of course will then form part of the second strategic transport projects review. Question number two, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to grow the economy of Cunningham North. Keith Brown. Sorry, it's Jamie Hepburn. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to achieving inclusive economic growth across Scotland, including in Cunningham North and North Ayrshire. Our enterprise agencies work with local businesses to help them to meet their growth aspirations. Scottish Enterprise currently account manages 150 companies in North Ayrshire, and Highlands and Islands Enterprise are actively engaging with key businesses on Arran and Cumbria. Last year, Scottish Development International supported 28 companies in North Ayrshire to internationalise and this year there's been inward investment worth £1 million to Cunningham North which created 10 new jobs and safeguarded 60. Uh, during yesterday's debate on the Local Government and Community uh, Committee's report on City Region deals, the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work and a number of Ayrshire MSPs, including the Member, called for the UK Government to commit to an Ayrshire growth deal. The Scottish Government has already confirmed that it's fully committed to that deal. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that reply. There are, in fact, a number of potentially exciting economic developments being taken forward in my constituency. However, some local employers fear that such developments will only lead to some of their skilled workers being enticed away by other businesses. How, therefore, do we ensure that the skills base is enhanced to ensure that local people benefit from additional employment opportunities and we don't just see skilled jobs moving from one company to, an to another with a marginal impact on unemployment? 
Jamie Hepburn. Uh, well, in, in the area of uh, Skills Scottish Enterprise and uh, uh, Skills Realm Scotland, they're active partners in the Team North Ayrshire uh, business support model, which provides companies with a, a coordinated approach to, to business and skills support. A, a good investment, of course, for any employer, presenting officer, is uh, the recruitment of apprentices. Skills Realm Scotland invested £2.3 million into the apprenticeship programme in North Ayrshire in 2016-17. Uh, as of uh, the end of 2017, there were 800 apprentices uh, in training. We also need to uh, support employers to upskill their existing workforce. We've introduced a, a pilot flexible workforce development fund. We have introduced the individual training accounts to help those in low-paid work and those seeking employment to upskill. And we continue to transform the approach to, to bring young people into the workforce through uh, developing the young workforce. Employers have a, a big role to, to play in terms of shaping and responding to that agenda. And just yesterday, I was uh, very delighted to attend a, an excellent DYW Ayrshire event in Irvine, where I saw uh, energy, creativity and enthusiasm of, of young people in vocational education and also of employers in responding to the, the skills challenges industry faces in uh, North, uh, South and East Ayrshire. Supplementary, Jamie Green. Thank you, Deputy Starting Officer. Despite everything the Minister has just said, over the last 10 years, the number of young people in employment in North Ayrshire has dropped from 60% to just 44%. It's the second lowest rate in Scotland. So can I ask the Minister, why does he think that is? And what is this government going to do about it? Jamie Hepburn. Well, we, we of course know that there are uh, various parts of the country where the, the challenge is more substantial than others. We know that uh, there is uh, an above average level of areas of uh, multiple deprivation in North Ayrshire, which brings uh, particular uh, challenges. Mr Green could have listened to my last answer, of course, in terms of some of the things that we're trying to do. It. Let me uh, re-rehearse it again. We're piloting our flexible workforce development fund. We've introduced individual training accounts. We're taking forward developing the young workforce, which, uh, let me say, in Ayrshire is well ahead of the curve. There's some fantastic uh, work there. And, of course, we're investing significantly in modern apprentices uh, in the area as well. And for those who are unemployed, uh, next month, uh, Fair Start Scotland will go live and many uh, people in, in North Ayrshire will be able to benefit by the introduction of that uh, project. Question number three, Claire Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the Glasgow City Region deal will bring to Motherwell and Whishaw. Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government has committed £500 million over 20 years to the Glasgow City Region deal to support delivery of a programme of investment to stimulate economic growth and to create jobs right across the city region. Three core North Lanarkshire projects have been identified by the Glasgow Regional Partners for Delivery within the first 10 years of the deal, accounting for a total capital investment of around £170 million. These projects are progressing and it should be noted, and I'm sure the member is aware, given the work that she's been doing in this area, that recent efforts to rescope have resulted in further positive impacts to the members' area. North Lanarkshire Council secured approval from the Glasgow City Region Cabinet in December 2017 to widen their existing programme to include the vital infrastructure upgrades still required at Ravenscraig. Claire Adamson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for his answer. Um, this new infrastructure will potentially make Ravenscraig one of, of the most um, attractive areas for potential development coming forward. Um, and although that's um, a few years in the making, in the, in the longer term, um, it offers some, some real um, opportunities in that area. So I'd just like to ask the Cabinet Secretary what the government can do to encourage people to look at the potential in Ravenscraig going forward. Keith Brown. Well, the Government does remain committed to working with North Lanarkshire Council and other parties for the further development of the Ravenscraig site. On top of the investment made so far, very considerable investment uh, in re remediating the site and also delivering the first phase of improvements, they've totaled around £45 million. Uh, Scottish Enterprise have also recently helped fund a refresh of the master plan for the site. I know the member from uh, meetings that she's asked for with me and others uh, is aware of that. But that new strategy has taken on board feedback from local residents and it includes thousands of new homes employment space, which I know is very important to the member, parkland and two new primary schools. But as the member is aware, the sheer scale of the Ravenscraig site means that a phased approach will still be necessary. However, we expect the revised planning application to be with North Lanarkshire Council in the coming weeks, and we will continue to work hard to help bring those plans to fruition in the years ahead. Supplementary, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, the, the, the work um, on Ravenscraig uh, approved by the City Deal Cabinet is to be applauded, but of course it's a new project for that City Deal. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that um, the, the City Deal Cabinet should be saying what projects are going to have to give way to, to make, way, make way for that 
they should be uh, clearer on what their plans are. Keith Brown. Well, I think uh, clarity and transparency are always a good thing, but as a member knows full well, it's not really for either this government or the UK government to dictate to uh, the Glasgow City Deal partners how they conduct their business, as long as it complies with the conditions uh, that were applied both when the UK government and the Scottish government made those funds available. It really is for those partners uh, to take it forward. And I think the member has asked of me in the past, and quite rightly, and I've acceded to the point, that we should allow some flexibility for the City Deal Cabinet to look afresh at some of the projects which they previously approved, not least because that was the first of the City Deals. It was some time ago. It was before City Deals have evolved to the extent that they have now. It was much more a list of infrastructure projects. I know the member's view is that one or two of the projects have not been the ones that he would have supported in his time. So there is a scope uh, within the flexibility that both uh, the Scottish and UK governments have offered in terms of flexibility to influence the Glasgow City Deal Cabinet, but really it is for them to take these decisions. Question number four, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to help achieve its ambition to become the data capital of Europe. Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Scottish Government is investing £300 million into the Edinburgh and South East Scotland city region, including £60 million towards innovation as part of a £1.1 billion investment announced in July 2017. Some 300 million of the overall sum is to be invested in world-leading data innovation centres, including the Base Centre for Data, Edinburgh Futures Institute and the Usher Institute, to support creation of the data capital of Europe through direct capital investment and creating an environment to nurture and attract further innovation and investment. Knowledge and innovation are key themes and one of the our eight Scottish Funding Council funded innovation centres, Data Lab, is taking great strides forward in supporting SDI's work in promoting Scotland more generally and Edinburgh within it as a natural choice for inward investors in data analytics and informatics. Gordon MacDonald. Sir, in order for Edinburgh to achieve its ambition to become the data capital of Europe, it will depend on collaboration and cooperation with other countries and the ability to attract people with the right skill sets. What impact could Brexit have on Edinburgh's ability to achieve this if we are outside the single market and there is a restriction on the free movement of people? Paul Wheelhouse. Important point that Gordon Macdonald raises, whilst assessment hasn't been made specifically on the potential of impact of Brexit on the ambitions for Edinburgh to become uh, the data capital of Europe, it is vital to, uh, to Scotland's economic interests, of course, that we're able to attract workers with the right skills. So therefore, it's a matter of great concern that leaving the single market and ending free movement of people in the UK will have a negative impact on our economy, on businesses and on the individuals and their families that are affected. UK government's own figures show the negative impact of a stricter immigration policy would be greater than the 0.2% boost to economic growth that, for example, a US trade deal uh, might bring. So we continue to believe that Scotland's interests are best served by EU membership and short of continuing EU membership, the best outcome for jobs and living standards is to retain membership of the single market and customs union. Question number five, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support the Fife economy. Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting inclusive economic growth uh, across Scotland, including in Fife. Uh, Fife has benefited from substantial additional investment in infrastructure, regeneration activity and business support, which is helping to create and retain jobs in communities across Fife. For example, targeted support of £6 million helped to deliver the Fife Task Force Action Plan, which has seen investment in locations such as Glenrothes. In addition, £2.7 million was awarded to Fife for an enterprise hub, industrial workshops and sub-regional business park in Kincardine to help foster economic resilience and benefit communities affected by the uh, early closure of Longanet Power Station. Uh, however, I do recognise in a number of uh, measures further progress is needed to help develop a more robust and resilient economy for the area. And I want to reassure the member I'm engaging with Fife Council and the Fife Economic Partnership to deliver that. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for the answer. It has been reported today that Bifab has received a letter of intent from 2B Energy to develop a two turbine demonstration that could extend to nine turbines. This is to be warmly welcomed and is testimony to the workforce. However, concerns remain that a subsidy package offered by the UK Government would require the turbines to be generating electricity by the end of September and this could jeopardise the project. Will the Minister join me in calling for the UK Government to extend the deadline and failing that, what action is the Scottish Government able to possibly take to ensure that the contract can go ahead? 
Paul Wheelhouse. Well, I, I certainly would warmly welcome the fact that that uh, contract is being offered to, to a very important company, Bifab, in, in the Fife area. Obviously, uh, we have uh, many engagements where we've been discussing, as the Cabinet Secretary has been leading on this issue, trying to help Bifab at this moment in time. The Cabinet Secretary, I can reassure the member, has written to the UK Government to try and stress the importance of allowing flexibility in relation to the, uh, the financial deadline for, for installation of the equipment that was being taken forward by 2B. They have obviously gone through a difficult time as a company. That has in part been triggered by this very issue. Uh, and we've been calling on the UK government to show sufficient flexibility, but I assure the member that we'll do everything we can to support uh, the company and to, to develop the technology here in Scotland, and we have indeed supported the project up to now. Supplementary, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is the Minister aware that Lower Largo is the birthplace of Alexander Selkirk, who provided the inspiration for Robinson yeah. Crusoe? Does he agree with me that there is a huge <sighs> amount of untapped tourism potential in my constituency, and will he agree to meet with me to discuss how repairing and restoring Lower Largo's historic pier could lead to the economic regeneration of coastal communities in my constituency and the wider Fife economy? I would expect supplementaries to be questions. Paul Wheelhouse. Um, what, what I can say to the member, presiding officer, is that I'm aware of the, the issue regarding the Largo Pier, and uh, I hadn't made the connection with the local hotel, but now I realise why it's called the Crusoe Hotel. Um, but uh, I am uh, clear that there, there are potential avenues of funding available from Historic Environment Scotland. However, it would be the owner of the site, uh, the hotel itself, that would need to apply. But I'm happy to discuss with the member any initiatives we can take to help support uh, the wider Fife economy and the tourism sector, which obviously uh, would be a matter directly responsible to, to, to Fiona Hislop as the minister. Question number six, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Scottish National Investment Bank will have the power to refuse to lend to commercially viable businesses that it considers operate against its public purpose missions. Keith Brown. Uh, I think in general terms, Presiding Officer, it's too early to provide detail on the lending activity of the bank at this stage. Uh, Benny Higgins has launched his implementation plan for a Scottish National Investment Bank on the 28th of February. Uh, the Scottish Cabinet will consider the report and its recommendations over the coming weeks and respond in early May. Uh, the plan recommends that Scottish ministers should set the parameters within which the bank should work by setting a strategic framework which will identify the missions that the bank will need to fulfil. Uh, the report, though, also recommends that the bank should be administratively and operationally independent of Scottish ministers and also uh, suggests that the bank should operate uh, not just to a code of ethics, but indeed going beyond regulatory requirements and adopt a best practice approach. Alison Johnson. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the response. Um, can he give assurances that the bank's investment strategy will at the very least be guided by the strongest of public interest principles, for example, that it will not lend to high carbon polluting industries or companies with poor workers' rights practices? Keith Brown. Well, the caveat of my previous response, I should say that it will be for the Scottish Government through engagement with the wider population and the mechanisms for that are still to be established to set the missions for the bank. And examples, we'd actually include the transition to a low carbon economy uh, or responding to demographic, uh, demographic pressures, including an ageing population or promoting place-based inclusive growth across all of Scotland. So ministers will consider the strategic framework under which the bank will operate uh, and progress the mission-based approach in Cabinet in the near future. That will be our process, but of course beyond that, I can commit to the member that both through the Parliament's committees, the relevant committees of the Parliament and in the Chamber itself, we will of course present our proposals and have them questioned by the Parliament as usual. Two quick supplementaries, please. Dean Lockhart, followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm what percentage of funding for the Scottish National Investment Bank will come from financial transactions money? Keith Brown. Well, the member will know because of the Scottish budget the amount that uh, the Finance Secretary has made available, but that's a starting position. So we are looking beyond that to see what other funding we can get. Financial transactions, as you know, is part of uh, the discretion which the Finance Secretary has just now, but that's not the limit of our ambition for the bank. We are in discussions with the Treasury at this stage to see what could be possible. We would like to see uh, a substantial portfolio of funds available, and some will be financial transactions, as the member says. I can't say what the percentage is until I know what the other size of the quantum is, and we expect to have that in future weeks and as soon as we do have that I'm happy to let the member know. Jackie Bailey. 
Um, the Cabinet Secretary has already suggested that the Scottish National Investment Bank will be capitalised by £2 billion over 10 years. If he's suggesting that will now indeed be higher, I welcome that, um, because Labour's proposals are, of course, 10 times that amount. So does the Cabinet Secretary consider that the Scottish National Investment Bank is in danger of being undercapitalised, as suggested by Jim McCall to the Economy Committee? Keith Brown. I think that there's no question that even at the £2 billion which has been mentioned, the Scottish National Investment Bank could make a real transformative difference to the Scottish economy. Uh, but of course it is the case uh, that we would like to see more than this. And long before the Labour Party got on board with this, we had requests of the UK Treasury, not least through the SFT, for between £5 and £7 billion of funding to allow us to take forward some of these major structural changes. But we do have to work with the money that we have, and we also have to work with the Treasury to ensure, for example, that we can carry forward balance from one year to another. That's unfortunately the reality of the position that we're in. So we'll carry on those discussions, but there is no lack of ambition from the Scottish Government as to what this bank might achieve. That concludes portfolio question time and we'll move on to the next item of business.